First of all, thanks for joining me in this session. Um, I know it's been a very long day, so please bear with me as I have some very interesting and exciting technologies to show you today. Um, my name is Miguel, Miguel Rojo. I'm leading our solution architects in Spain and Portugal. And today I'm here with Brecht uh, to show you uh, how AI and ML can be used to improve your own organizations. I'll show you what we're doing internally at Amazon, uh, for example, with our fulfillment centers and some other cool projects. And then I'll show you the AWS services that you can use to use ML and AI in your own organizations. Afterwards, Brecht will show you what they're, what they're doing at Skin Vision uh, to improve the lives of everyone. So let's start by a trend that we can see in our day-to-day -day lives. I don't have a clicker. <laughs> Thanks. So let's start by a trend that we can see in our day-to-day -day lives. Everything will eventually connect. We have a growing number of IoT devices. We have a growing number of mobile phones. Who here doesn't have a mobile phone? We have a growing number of cameras. Your phones have cameras. There are cameras around cities. Who here is running a smart city? Anyone? Well, um, we are basically acquiring data to sense the actual physical world. And together with this amount of data, so we have large amounts of data, we need to process it. And we can do that with cloud services. And we can basically use cloud services to process data, potentially, in real time. And once we analyze all of those data points, we can gain insights. And through those insights, by, by analyzing them, we can identify patterns. And through those patterns, we can learn. And this is something that we can do with a technology that's been with us for quite a few years now. It's from the 80s, and it's called uh, deep learning. So deep learning will enable us to create machine learning models that uh, will allow us to interact with applications in totally different ways, maybe through vision or maybe through voice. So we have uh, tens of thousands of customers that are running machine learning workloads on AWS. We have universities, like for example, the University of Stanford. What they've done in Stanford, they've created a deep learning model, a machine learning model, that allows them to diagnose one of the precursors of dia uh, blindness caused by diabetes. So they analyze pictures of eyes, and they're able to diagnose in a very early stage if someone uh, has one of these precursors that might cause diabetes, uh, blindness caused by diabetes. We also have uh, companies like, for example, Netflix. Netflix is running recommendations on top of AWS. So they uh, basically analyze the movies and series that you watch, and they recommend others that you might also uh, like to watch, basically to retain you in the platform. So how does deep learning work? Well, I think that I can explain it to you with an example. And let's get us an example, a Rubik's Cube. Everybody knows what a Rubik's Cube is, right? Popular toy in the 80s. Well, this is a 3x3 three three version. I myself haven't been able in my whole life to solve one. I can sit in front of the cube for one hour, trying it, twisting it around. No way. Totally impossible. I then go to YouTube, and I see these guys that they take a look at the cube for five seconds. They sit in front of it. They blindfold themselves and go. <laughs> Done. The cure is done in four seconds. And I'm like, am I stupid or what? Well, the thing is that they know the patterns. So there are patterns inside that cube. And if you know them, you're able to solve the cube. So how many patterns do you think there are in one of these 3x3 three three Rubik cubes? One million? Two million? Well, there are over 43 quintillion different and unique combinations in the cube. So we could try and solve that cube by trying each of these combinations one after the other, but it's uh, kind of uh, totally impossible. It's kind of doing like a brute force attack. So what can we do? We can create a learning function, a machine learning model. So we basically have our learning function, a cube that we do know how to solve, and its solution. And we use this cube and its solution to train the model. And our learning function, our model, will learn. Now its accuracy, it's up to a 1%. If we do this one more time with another cube that we do know how to solve and its solution, 
the accuracy of the learning function will go up to a 2%. And if we do this many, many times, maybe 100, 200 times, with cubes that we do know how to solve together with their solution, the cubes didn't show. There, be, there should be many cubes falling around. The accuracy has gone up to a 95%. So if we try many, many cubes, then uh, the accuracy goes up of our learning function. And now, if we input a cube that we don't know how to solve, the learning function, the model, will tell us uh, which is the solution to, fi uh, to um, finish that cube with a percentage of accuracy. In this case, 95%. So I, now I can go one step further, and I can deploy that model in a mini robot with some cameras and actuators. And I can try and use machine learning to solve the cube in 0 0.9 seconds. So YouTube guys, I beat you. The thing you have to remember is that in uh, deep learning, we are not coding a solution. So we are letting the system learn through data. So we give it the patterns, and we let it learn. The thing is that we need a lot of data. We basically have the data, and we use it to train a model using a positive or a negative reinforcement. Once we have the model ready, we can use that model to obtain predictions. And usually, the first iteration um, won't be the best. So the, the quality of the model, usually it's not, uh, it's not the best when you create the first version. What we do is we get the outputs from the model, and we use it as feedback to create new versions. So we do this many, many, many times until we have a model uh, which provides us the accuracy that we need. In AWS, well, in Amazon, the global business, we've been doing this for uh, quite some time now, basically since Amazon.com was created. Uh, we are doing machine learning at our retail business. So for example, when we are packaging the goods, uh, we're also doing um, machine learning when you are uh, browsing our retail website. You get recommendations on products that you might want to buy. That's driven by machine learning. And we're also uh, doing machine learning, for example, on our Kindle business. So uh, on the Kindle business, we allow you to publish your own books, but we don't want you to publish something that was already written by someone else. So we do plagiarism detection. I'm going to go a little bit deeper on some of the, of the projects that we're running inside Amazon. Um, the first one, you for sure already know, it's the Amazon Echo. The Amazon Echo, it's uh, a device that allows you to interact with the Alexa voice services. She already put the voice to the, to the keynote this morning. Um, basically, we have many kinds of these devices. This is the first version. We have the smaller ones. We have ones with cameras. So we have the Echo Dot, the Echo uh, Spot, the Echo Plus, which allows you to interact with IoT devices. And we also have uh, third-party devices that can interact with the Alexa voice services. So basically, uh, what's the Alexa voice services? It's interacting through voice with a smart system. And you can ask Alexa to set an alarm or to set a reminder to add something to your shopping list. Or you can even make her um, add a new skill. So we, we allow third parties to create skills for Alexa. Uh, for example, you can order a pizza from Domino. So you can book a taxi or book a Uber. And cities have also created skills. So for example, the city of Los Angeles created a skill to check for the events that are happening in the city. So you just have to ask Alexa for, hey, Alexa, what's happening today in, in LA, in Los Angeles? And she'll tell you what's happening in the city. So it's a great way to, um, through machine learning, be able to interact maybe for people who have disabilities or for people who are blind, who have, don't find it easy to type. Well, they can interact through the voice. The next thing I want to talk to you about is Amazon Prime Air. This is the first prototype of our drone. It's really cool, right? But we didn't build it because it was cool. Um, it's a great example of uh, doing something that we do really well at Amazon, which is working backwards from the customer. So we built it because we had to solve something that our customers needed. That was basically 30-minute deliveries. So from the moment that someone pushes the buy button on the website, we have 30 minutes to get the, the order to their house. 
And how can we do that? Well, we can use drones. We basically have to put a stack on the floor where you want the drone to land. It will fly to your house, recognize the tag, so do some computer vision there. Uh, we also have kind of IoT, know where the drone is flying, some GPS tracking, and it's a great way to deliver the last, to do the last mile delivery. But if you think of it, there's uh, a lot of things that need to happen in 30 minutes. So we need to grab the goods from the warehouse, pack them, and get, in, get them shipped. And this is something that takes a lot of time. So how can we improve this? Well, we can um, check how we deal with our warehouses, with our fulfillment centers. This is the first version of our fulfillment center. There's nothing really strange here. There are some aisles, so people can walk through those aisles and, and grab the, the products from the order. If you Take a look at it. There are everything is stored in the same place. So, for example, if you wanted to buy a computer, uh, normally you wouldn't buy two computers at the same time, uh, at least not of the same model. So, why store everything like that? Uh, usually, with a computer, you'd buy maybe a keyboard or a mouse. So, the the person picking up the goods would have to walk long distances to find the different products where they're stored around, around the fulfillment center. So how can we improve this? Well, in Amazon, we iterate it. And we created the second version of the fulfillment centers, which are basically driven by robots. So these are the Kiva robots, now rebranded as Amazon Robotics. Um, these small robots go by themselves through the fulfillment centers. They go underneath one of these shelves that hold the goods. They spin up leave the shelf from the floor, and take it to the person who's packaging the, all the order. Uh, there's some kind of IoT there, the robots talking to themselves, machine learning, because the, um, the robots have to find the most optimized route to get to the person packaging the goods. So uh, machine learning everywhere. If we take a look at these shelves, uh, they look a little bit chaotic, right? So everything, there's not two products of the same thing in the same shelf. Well, we're doing actually implementing kind of like the chaos theory here. Um, we are doing machine learning by analyzing things that our customers buy together. So if you were to buy the computer and you would buy together with the computer a mouse and a keyboard, we can store those three things together in the same shelf. So that's a good way of uh, implementing machine learning to solve something that is a real problem uh, at an organization. But problems also happen. So something might fall when the robots are driving around. And how can we solve this? Again, with computer vision. So when the, when the little robots go to the packing station, they enter through an arrival tower, then they go through the station, and through a departure tower. And when they go through these towers, we take pictures. And we then analyze those pictures to check if what we have on the database is exactly the same as what's on the shelf. So we do computer vision there. Then we also want to analyze the remaining space that we have in the shelf. So we do a, a mapping to check what can fit in the small spaces that we have left on the shelf. That's powered by a deep learning model based on CAFE, which was trained on our P2 instances. Now we have the P3s, which I'll talk to um, about later. And this is another invention by Amazon that also uses uh, machine learning and computer vision. It's basically a store. I'm sure you've already heard about it, the Amazon Go store. It's in Seattle. And it's also working backwards from the customer. So our customers don't want to queue when paying for the goods when they're in a store. So what can we do? We can use machine learning to improve that. So I'm going to play a, a video now to show you how, how it works. Just about a little bit over one minute. Four years ago, we started to wonder, what would shopping look like if you could walk into a store, grab what you want, and just go? What if we could weave the most advanced machine learning, computer vision, and AI into the very fabric of a store so you never have to wait in line? No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Welcome to Amazon Go. 
use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. It's really that simple. Take whatever you like. Anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. If you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. So how does it work? We used computer vision, deep learning algorithms, and sensor fusion, much like you'd find in self-driving cars. We call it Just Walk Out Technology. Once you've got everything you want, you can just go. When you leave, our Just Walk Out technology adds up your virtual cart and charges your Amazon account. Your receipt is sent straight to the app, and you can keep going. Amazon Go. No lines, no checkout. No, seriously. So this, um, this video is a little bit old. It says coming early 2017. Um, first, uh, the access to the store was only available to Amazon employees. Now, uh, since a couple of months ago, is anyone can enter the store and buy whatever they want if they have the app running on their, on their phone. So you've seen the many things that we do regarding machine learning at Amazon.com. So how can you implement this in your own applications? Well, you can use the machine learning services that we provide in AWS. We've already talked a little bit about this on the keynote this morning, but I'll go a little bit deeper, not much, because I don't, I don't want you to get your head like this. We have many services. And we are trying to make it easy for you to use machine learning. So how do we do this? We have our machine learning stack. It's divided in three different layers. The first layer are services that we already uh, have trained. We've done the real uh, uh, difficult stuff, which is training a deep learning model. And you basically can use those services by making an API call. We have a second layer, which are platform services. So if the API services are not enough for you and you want to train your own machine learning model, well, you can use uh, the platform services. And then we have a part of frameworks, which are all the different frameworks that allow you to create uh, deep neural networks and a part of infrastructure. So the instances that you need to train all of those, uh, you to train your models, basically. I'll start by talking about the API services. And I'll go deeper in this part because they're the easiest to use. They are divided in several parts, vision, speech, and language. I'll first talk to you about Amazon Recognition. It's a computer vision service. You basically upload a file to S3, our object storage service, and you make an API call to recognition saying, hey, here's my file. Do some, ob some object detection on that file. And recognition will output a JSON file telling you, hey, I found maybe in that picture over there a skater. There's a skateboard. There's a parking. There are cars. It looks like a street. So it does object and scene recognition. You can also do image moderation. So it can tell you if there's adult content on that, on, the, on that picture. It can do facial analysis. So it can tell you if, if there's a man or a woman in the picture, if their eyes are open, if he has a beard, if, ha if, um, if his uh, mouth is open, if he's smiling, and sentiments, if he's happy or not. You can also do uh, face comparison. So you can add faces to recognition, create a collection, and then be able to search between different faces. And it also does celebrity recognition and um, text recognition. So we can detect, it can detect uh, text in images. One of the customers running recognition in production is the Washington County Sheriff's Office in, in Oregon. They basically created uh, a system that was only available in the movies before. So they're able to search for a picture in, uh, well, for the, for the photo of someone in pictures. Uh, basically, what they did is they indexed 300,000 mag shots to be able to look for possible sus suspects when uh, something had taken place. And now, uh, when they deployed it in production, after just uh, one week of going live, they found the first su suspect, thanks to, thanks to using recognition. We can also do recognition on video. 
So it does exactly the same as uh, recognition on pictures, but it can also do object uh, person tracking. So if someone gets in and out of the video, we recognize who that person is and we'll tell you in which uh, second of the video that person has gone in and out. We also have another service, which is Amazon Polly. It's a speech service. So it allows you to do a text to speech. It's basically uh, very natural. So the voice is really, really natural. If you input, for example, the temperature in Brussels is 15 degrees C. Well, actually, today it's a little bit more than 50 degrees. Um, it will say the temperature in Brussels is 15 degrees Celsius. So um, the way in which uh, Polly speaks, it's really, really natural. It has over 50 languages, uh, 50 different voices, 24 languages. And um, it's been being used by many customers. One of them is the Royal National Institute for the Blind in the, in the UK. What they're doing is they're using Polly to put their voice to audiobooks. And why did they choose Polly? Because of how natural it is. Another service that I want to talk to you about is Transcribe. Transcribe allows you to do the opposite. So from voice, get the text. You basically input a, a file, a WAV file, or an, uh, an MP3 or an MP4 with, uh, with a specific recording of the voice, and it will output uh, the, the text that, uh, that the service has found on that, on that specific recording. It supports uh, telephony audio, integration with S3. Uh, one cool thing it does, it's, it tells you the timestamp. Uh, so if you're looking for a particular word, it will tell you in which second it's found that word. It also recognizes multiple speakers, and uh, you can add custom vocabulary to, to uh, Amazon Transcribe. The next service is Lex. Lex, it's a chatbot service. Think of it as what's inside Alexa. So it allows you to create your own chatbot. It's a natural language understanding service. Potential use cases. So for example, uh, informational services uh, to, for customer support. It's integrated, for example, with uh, our, um, our customer, uh, customer, um, customer engagement service uh, called uh, Amazon Connect. And uh, it can be used as a voice assistant. Who's using this service? For example, the American Heart Association. Instead of having to register uh, by filling up some papers, you can now use Lex to register into the association by using the voice, just your voice. Next service, Amazon Translate. Translate allows you to translate uh, text between different languages. Right now, it supports 12 different language pairs. Uh, it also uses deep learning, learning underneath, and the translation is real time. Detects the language, and uh, we we can basically translate uh, in between these 12 uh, language pairs. The next service, Comprehend. Comprehend allows you to do natural language understanding, but without having to train your own model. So it allows you to check for um, sentiments. I was checking that the, the smiley was not very yellow. Uh, it allows you to check for sentiments. It allows you to uh, check for entities. So we'll tell you which are the entities that it's found on the text, which are the key phrases, which language that uh, text is written on, and it can do topic modeling too. Let's move on to the platform services. So the platform services are basically services that allow you to train your own models or to deploy your own models on those services. Uh, when the API services are not enough for you. So if you wanted to create your own model back uh, some time ago, um, you needed a lot of data scientists who knew how to code algorithms. You needed uh, a lot of infrastructure, and it took a lot of time to be able to do this. Well, we released a service in December called Amazon SageMaker. SageMaker is a service which allows you to build, train, tune and host custom models in the cloud and then deploy them for inference or at the edge. So it will basically allow you to um, deploy a fully managed notebook with a single click. Use that notebook to browse the data that you have 
to be able to train the model, select the algorithm that you want to use to train. Uh, we include many algorithms already in SageMaker that have already been, uh, been specifically designed to run on SageMaker, and they are really, really performant. And then, with a single click, you are able to uh, begin to train the, the model. In this process, we tune and select the most optimized model using a, a technology which is called hyperparameter optimization. And when the model is ready, when we think that we found the most optimized model, with another click, you are able to deploy that model on a series of uh, high available instances in your own VPC, uh, deployed on several ACs, so that you are able to uh, query that model for predictions. So SageMaker allows you to deploy this on your own instances, or you can deploy it at the edge. And what do I mean at the edge? So maybe on IoT devices. Or maybe you can deploy it on cameras. So we have another service, which is called DeepLens, AWS DeepLens. It's basically the world's first deep learning enabled video camera. We, uh, right now, we, it's not on sale. It'd be on sale from June. But there are many, many people who are already trying it out. Um, it basically allows you to deploy the machine learning models on this camera and run them in real time on the camera itself. How can we do this? Well, the deep lens camera is powered by an Atom X5 processor from Intel. It includes some um, libraries by Intel that allow you to um, do the learning actually really fast in the camera. So we couldn't have done it without the technology by, by Intel. Uh, one of the, uh, of the customers that's been uh, using this uh, it has created a deep learning model that allows you to check for sign language. So if you do sign language in front of the camera, the camera will speak the letter that you are actually doing with your hands. Now let's move on to the frameworks and infrastructure. There are lots of frameworks that you can use uh, to create deep learning models. They have very weird names. TensorFlow, MXNet, CAFE, Torch. And we are trying to make it easier for you to use these frameworks. So we created a deep learning AMI. An AMI is an Amazon machine image. It already includes all, all of these frameworks already pre-installed. So if you want to do machine learning, you can basically spin up an instance with this AMI, and you can begin to, to do deep learning. It's optimized for our C5 instances. So these instances have a chip by Intel, which uses a, a technology uh, with a particular set of instructions, which is called AVX512. And it's, uh, this AMI is really optimized to be able to run on the C5 instances. Um, I've already talked about the C5 instances. We also have the P3s, GPUs. So when people think about deep learning, they always think about uh, training the model on GPUs. Well, the truth is that it really depends on the size of the data that you have and that uh, you want to train with. Uh, if it's a very, very large data set, go for GPUs. But if it's not so large, if it's small to medium, it might be much better to train your model on, on other instances like the C5s. Why? Because of two things, basically. The first one is the cost. So. Well, this is the, the, the AVX 512 instruction set. But the cost I was talking to you about is this. The C5 instances um, are really, if you compare the cost to the performance, are really much better. So the biggest instance that we have in the C5s, the C518X large, is around $3.5 per hour. And if you compare it to the uh, GPU instances, the P3s, those are $26 per hour. So if we put many of these C5 instances in parallel to do the training, we can get uh, much, uh, much many more things trained than just with a single P3 instance. And this is the on-demand cost. If we move to the spot market, so you fix the price that you want to pay, the top price that you want to pay for our infrastructure that we're not using now in our data centers, well, in that case, we have lots of C5 instances available, so you can get great discounts, but we don't have so many P3 instances available. So you can really train data, put in parallel many C5 instances, 
and it'll be really, really great and more cost effective than using GPUs. Now, I'm going to leave you with, uh, with Brecht from Skin Vision. Uh, you already uh, saw him this, this morning explaining once what Skin Vision does. He'll go a bit deeper on the technical side of, of their machine learning that they're running on top of AWS. But basically, remember that they are on a mission to save 250,000 lives in the next decade. So please, Brecht, welcome to the stage. Hello, everyone, and uh, maybe welcome again. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, if you were here this morning during the keynote, uh, you might have already heard a bit about what we do at Skin Vision. Uh, as Miguel already said, I would like to take you a bit deeper into uh, how we use technology at Skin Vision. Uh, but for those of you who didn't, uh, weren't able to attend the keynote, a short uh, introduction and pretty much why we're in the game. Um, Skin cancer is one of the fastest growing globally uh, forms of cancer uh, worldwide. And one in five people will develop skin cancer in some form at some point in their lives. And in certain types of population, it's even more. Um, for example, in Australia and New Zealand, perhaps two out of three people will develop skin cancer. Um, at the same time, the uh, growing incidence of skin diseases, cancer, but also uh, other, for example, sun uh, exposure-induced diseases, uh, lead to a pressure on the health system. So uh, people live longer. We, uh, in general, have more budget. Uh, we can take a plane to the sun. We spend more time on holidays. So our sun is much more exposed. We have more leisure time, etc. So that combined uh, with um, uh, the development of, of cancer will lead both to a higher pressure on the health system and, of course, an increased cost. So what we have done at Skin Vision is build a platform. Um, you could call it a dermatologist in your pocket, where we pretty much globally make dermatology services available uh, and at the same time use technology to do that cost-effectively, uh, at high speed, and accurately. So what does it look like? Um, the Skin Vision platform in itself, or the, the, the product offering, you could say, consists of three things. One of that is that we have um, probably the largest dermatology clinic um, in the world. So we have, uh, they're real people, they're, uh, they're trained, licensed dermatologists that work for us. So we are able to pull this dermatology capacity. Um, next to that, we have our application and uh, uh, the, the web portals that we're using. And of course, uh, like I said before, the technology that I will go into uh, more detail uh, in the next slides. Uh, one thing I think that is um, very interesting for uh, the dermatologists that work with us, and it's not just the people that work in the clinic, but also uh, around us, is that due to the amount of um, pictures that people send in, um, at this moment we have more than one million users uh, of skin vision. We have collected more than th three million pictures of skin cancer, and that number is growing every day. Um, out of those pictures, we have already identified 15,000 cases of uh, skin cancer. That means that people that work with uh, skin vision um, the dermatologists uh, that review all the pictures as part of our uh, uh, quality service see so many more pictures than they would normally in a practice. It's roughly a factor of 20 uh, of, uh, of disease area, uh, of disease uh, images than they would normally see if they were uh, see people face to face. So there's an effect in there that uh, allows us also to train the dermatology level globally. And um, uh, from what I hear from our dermatologists, they can do uh, 200 uh, uh, images per hour. So that's really maximizing productivity. Um, our application that we have built is pretty much, like I said, the dermatologist in your pocket. Um, it's an application it's free to download from, uh, from both uh, stores. Uh, allows you to make an assessment uh, using our uh, capture technology that is in there. Um, 
And that monitoring also, um, just distracted by uh, the ticking monitor here. Uh, the application not only allows you to take a picture to be analyzed by our technology, it also allows you to self-monitor uh, for those lesions that may not be accessible yet or that you're not willing to send in. Uh, I will talk a bit about the pricing model when you compare it to, uh, uh, let's say, normal dermatology in clinic later. Uh, and our technology, which is highly accurate, it's uh, been clinically validated by multiple respected clinics. Um, and like I said, in our cameras, we have a smart data capturing technology, which pretty much uh, acts as a flywheel. So we get more data in, and that allows us to improve the service every day. <coughs> Sorry. So what does it look like? Uh, schematically, um, our service consists of the, of the three pillars. The application that people have uh, send in an assessment, and within a minute, uh, usually under 30 seconds, we deliver uh, our users a risk assessment of a certain skin lesion, a mole. As part of our quality system, every picture gets checked by a dermatologist. That's not because we do not uh, rely on our algorithm, because our algorithm is uh, up there with a specialist dermatologist. But we do it as a special control. Um, people of you uh, that might be operating in regulated areas uh, are may be familiar with these terms. Um, and to be able to communicate to our users if necessary. Um, and at the same time, to tag all our data to help our machine learning uh, to improve. So that's where you see um, the circle going, uh, going back. <coughs> so this is what it, uh, uh, what it looks like. We have a, uh, in addition to the actual risk classification, we have uh, various machine learning components, uh, one of them being uh, lesion identification. If you make a picture of your skin using our application, there might be uh, um, a lesion that is undetectable or there might be multiple. So we have a machine learning network that is best in class to uh, segment the lesion out of it from um, the backend. I will run you through it. I have some examples uh, later on. Uh, as I said, clinically validated um, and more than three and a half million pictures. Excuse me. So um, we've been working with Amazon because it gives us a license to operate. Uh, Amazon is globally available. Um, we currently uh, are based uh, with the infrastructure in Ireland. Um, as you can see, various components uh, that allow us to scale, uh, deploy this securely, uh, our backends, our web portals run there, and of course, our machine learning risk assessment. And we use a pr pretty much uh, apart from the, the obvious uh, EC2, RDS, uh, S3, uh, uh, instance for data storage and processing, we use Redshift uh, as a data warehouse. So uh, diving a, dip, a bit deeper into the service, um, again, uh, users can, uh, can very simply take a picture and submit it uh, to our systems. Our risk assessment services run uh, the various uh, assessment steps that we, um, and that we have. The results are stored in our databases and on uh, the resulting images are stored on S3. Um, and then the user gets back the result all within a minute. Now, like I said, this is a machine learning pipeline and we run, in addition to the deployment, we run all our training uh, on S3. Uh, of course, since we have so many images, we need something at scale, but also uh, since skin cancer images are potentially sensitive, um, we want to run it or want to have them stored securely on S3 and not on people's laptops, for example. Um, here is a somewhat simplified uh, image of our risk assessment pipeline. We have a few more steps, but they're not, not always interesting to, to share with you. But in, uh, in general, since we work with consumer electronics, um, just your uh, smartphone, uh, we need to uh, take care of being able to actually process the input. Why this is important is that um, there are more image analysis techniques available, but in general, those work in a very controlled scope. For example, a dermoscope 
uh, as a tightly controlled input. Uh, you have the same for, for example, MRI image analysis. We work with consumer electronics, with consumers, with different levels of skill, different levels of expectations, uh, different forms of lighting, uh, et cetera, et cetera. In addition to that, uh, it's not just that there's different phones, there's different firmwares, and even within a firmware uh, globally, there might be uh, deviations. So one important step we have there is color correction. Um, we noticed that, for example, Android phones tend to range uh, in their color temperature, being either very warm uh, orangey colors or very cold bluish colors, uh, etc. In order to be able to normalize those inputs, we have a special color correction step. So um, I thought to make this visually uh, show you, uh, these are actual uh, images uh, that, that we are using. So just for fairly random examples. Um, being normalized, they might look a bit washed. No, it's OK there. Um, so bring them into brackets, you could say. So our color correction step processes those input images, stores them again on S3 so we can later analyze it, what the, uh, what the various steps do. And then we run on those uh, images uh, segmentation. You see here uh, a mask, which pr pretty much is a, um, a separate machine learning step that says, hey, this is skin that is not of interest to me. Uh, it is of interest to dermatologists. They look at, uh, at spots on the skin or different uh, kind of developments. But for our algorithm, it's really important to look at just the lesion at the mall. So uh, we use those masks to uh, further clean the image. Um, the way we do the, uh, the risk assessment, we have to look at, uh, at irregular patterns that we see in images. Well, unless you have a very good um, um, eidetic memory, you, uh, you probably won't know the difference. That's why I put them uh, side by side. And for example, in the top left image, image A, you can see spots in the top left corner. You see some hairs. Um, you see, um, well, take some time. In the bottom right image, you see all kinds of, of spottiness that is really of no interest to our algorithm. Once we've processed this, we are able to run this through uh, a fractal analysis algorithm. Fractal analysis is a, a way to detect uh, self-similarity or vice versa, um, uh, irregular growth. And this is what the output images look like. They're nicely color-coded. Um, as you can see, for, for a lot of users, that doesn't mean anything, but at least it shows that we, um, it's pretty much a color representation of the output of the algorithm. And you could see that in, in some images, there's a bit more um, chaos. And finally, uh, we run our uh, classifier. Again, that's a machine learning component uh, that we've trained on uh, lots of images that we have available that have been tagged by uh, senior dermatologists. And here you see, for these four images, um, the risk classification. We do low, high, and medium uh, outputs. Uh, and based on that, we advise people to see uh, their doctors. So what does that mean? Um, in general, um, the technology that we have developed, or in general that is being developed around mobile health and e-health, will allow people to uh, become much more aware of potential diseases early on. Um, at the same time, uh, the, the cost of the, um, uh, on the health system is growing. So if we can uh, avoid people sending people into the health system, the, the health business case um, is huge. On the global $24 billion uh, dermatology market, the cost savings that we can achieve uh, can be about a factor 10. With the platform that we have developed, um, we are right now focusing on skin cancer since that is the, the toughest to crack. And it's, a, it's of course, a terrible disease. Um, and that's why it has been our, uh, our focal point initially. Uh, but the platform that we have built allows us to um, expand into other disease areas uh, by uh, combining our uh, clinic and uh, using that to uh, assess new images uh, of uh, new skin disease types. And based on those taggings, 
roll out new um, technology for the disease type. So we have a continuously improving system with a scalable service. Um, as I already said, AWS for us has been a, uh, a key enabler. Um, we've gotten a lot of support, uh, both in terms of knowledge uh, and, and otherwise, um, to, uh, to really make a leap. Uh, and we're not done yet. What we see as very important is that uh, services just like Skin Vision, um, it, it's our firm belief that these should be reimbursed services. Uh, and for this, we also need to integrate deeper with the health system. That needs to be uh, done securely, of course. Um, and if we can do this and put this in the hand of GPs, um, as I said this morning during the keynote, um, a lot of GPs aren't very good at detecting skin cancer. So by not just giving our technology in the hands of end consumers, but in uh, the hands of practitioners, making sure that technology really uh, enables, uh, accelerates uh, the health system and drives costs down, we believe we have a uh, very bright future for all of us. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, I will be in the uh, uh, lobby afterwards. So, thank you. Thank you.